probably need at least four, maybe five experts to prove whether that was caused by the, the breach of duty. So it's incredibly complicated. So if you had a no-fault scheme, how is that going to save all those investigations on causation? So when someone says, oh, no-fault scheme is the answer to everything, it's not. Because if you competed everyone, the bill would be enormous. So you have to limit them. You have to filter them. At the moment... So you're saying the law, the law of tort is the filter? Yeah. And the poor lawyer does all the filtering for free. I can, I can hear the violins playing now. <laughs> <laughs> I spat my beer out then. Let's lighten the mood. You're a clinical negligence lawyer. Does the health care that you and your family receive change when you are having that conversation in a consultation? And having that, what do you <laughs> we, do? We're going back to these conversations in the pub now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> this is pub chat. This is pub. Yeah, CPD. this is definitely pub chat. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, there's been two occasions where I've happened to mention what I do to, uh, <laughs> to, to a treating uh, doctor, and, the, and, and the dentist took the drill out your mouth and told you to get out. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a dentist. No, there, there were two occasions. I, I I injured my knee skiing many many years ago when I went to hospital and. Um, I went in, had the examination. It, they said it was all fine. I was having a bit of chit chat with a, a junior doctor after it had all been done. And I just happened to mention that I work for the biggest medical lectures firm in Wales. And he went, he trotted off. He didn't say anything. He came back and he goes, I just, I've reconsidered. And I think maybe you should have an MRI scan. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he sent me off for an MRI scan. And um, actually they did find some damage, but it, um, we man they managed to sort it out without any too much um, too much problem. I don't think it would have made much difference either way. But and the other time was when um, my wife was giving birth to um, to my younger son. I was sitting there with a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit while my poor wife was um, was not quite so relaxed. And the anaesthetist uh, was chatting to us, and she was lovely. The anaesthetist, she was such a nice woman, and um, she was just putting the epidural in. And she, we were chatting and she said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a lawyer. And my wife said, oh, I'm a lawyer. And she goes, oh, I bet you're a medical legislator, lawyer, aren't you? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, we are, yeah. Oh, oh. And she said, and then she pretended to shake while she was, oh, I, I better not make a stink. And she was, um, she was really very, very nice about it. And actually, we then had a chat after she put in, she'd done the anaesthetic and it was all, it was all great. We had a chat about something they were doing in UHW at the, at the time, a trial, where in the coffee room, they were showing the CTG traces so that when the consultants were in the coffee room having a coffee and a chat they could see the traces and they were looking at them and then they think oh actually what do you think of that one and they'd go and check and I thought that was an absolutely brilliant idea because it just sort of bit of check. For the regular listener will know that we've talked many times about coffee room chats and in general practice there's been some work looking at it it's called mind lines and they talk about the importance of coffee room chats and we've discussed it before on here but we um it's a big thing about working from home isn't it and not being in the office and we think in our firm the amount of sort of good thinking and ideas and supervision that happened just over a coffee um. yeah well go back to you know we were both saying about the importance of documenting look i wasn't sure i discussed it with a colleague you know i've actually seen people write in notes i took it to the clinical meeting over coffee it was discussed and the thought was this and then discussed it with the patient so there you go it happens in real life and it's a very good way of as you say it's not about being trying to act defensively is it it's about it's just sensible isn't it i have seen steve shut a conversation down very quickly mind it was on the side of a football pitch local to us you know healthcare professionals they seem to gather together don't they when they're watching their kids play football or rugby and and there was a a couple of gps and anaesthetist <laughs> And they were having a, a, a lovely Saturday morning chat and over, over drifts uh, Steve. And I'm very conscious now that they're having quite a clinical conversation on the side of the football pitch, therapeutic pearls. And, and, uh, and as Steve comes into the conversation, I say, oh, Steve, I, I introduce him. And I'm very quick to introduce him as uh, this is Steve. He's a clinical negligence lawyer. <laughs> and it just changes the tone of the uh, uh, of the, the Saturday morning learning. Although I seem to remember, Jane, that the discussion then was about people's children doing yachting and stuff like that. And as me and Jamie were brought up in Bridgend, we didn't have the same problems in Bridgend about that our, our yacht wasn't quite ready for the Saturday morning uh, regatta. It was more whether we could tape up the, the gap in our football boots. One last thing, if I can, about the no-fault compensation schemes when I was reading about it was, so we talk about positive defensive medicine in other words we're being over cautious and we're doing too many tests and like your junior doctor who sent you for an mri scan 
who, using your analogy, you may well have already had damage to your knee from something else that you've done playing rugby, not necessarily due to the skiing. So there's positive defensive medicine, but I hadn't realised that there's a term of negative defensive medicine, which of course then when I read it, I understood it, which is, and I know I worked in a cardiothoracic hospital in Manchester and they used to look at cardiothoracic mortality for every single surgeon and it's this idea is that if the patient appears too risky they don't want it to necessarily affect their mortality data therefore they're less likely to take on the patient so as I understand it these schemes might help that because clearly there are people who are very high risk but actually you know their life expectancy is very low if they don't go ahead with it but perhaps a surgeon decides not to do it because they're so high risk. Is that have I read that right in relation to these schemes as well? I, I absolutely. If if you if you look at things like league tables and trying to compare different surgeons' sort of mortality rates, then you've got to be very careful. You may have a, an absolutely fantastic surgeon who generally is operating on the most risky patients, and therefore they may have a higher mortality rate. So I think you'll be very careful when. You're taking that sort of, you make a decision whether to operate on the basis of what's the upside, what's the downside, the the risk benefit to the patient. You shouldn't be making it on any sort of analysis of whether there'd be a claim. And of course, the law of tort would allow you to do that. But as long as you get proper informed consent, unless the treatment is so poor that it's below the acceptable standard of care, no other reasonable doctor would have done it, then you'd have no difficulty with that. But I read that the, the idea of the no-fault compensation schemes may mean that if there is any of that, then that will dissipate. Possibly. There's obviously a risk that that would be compensated because there would be a bad outcome and they're not considering whether it's a breach or not or a fault, they're just a bad outcome. Therefore, that person will be compensated, where in the UK, that person wouldn't be compensated because... A bad outcome is not enough. It has to be a bad outcome from a breach of duty. Yeah, I guess you're you're locked into the legal world. I was actually just thinking about it in a non-legal sense. You know, if somebody was able to go ahead and have that life-saving operation because before people were acting in a negatively defensive way because they were worried about, so not necessarily a legal case. So as I understood it, that these schemes might allow that to be less of a problem as well. I can see how that might be a feeling that people have, yeah. The Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes, executive coach and one less pill.com. Okay, well, fascinating stuff. I think we wanted to take the oral apothecary in different directions, and this is certainly one of those because we haven't talked about stuff like this before. So thanks very much, Steve. Now, I think you are aware that by agreeing to come on to the oral apothecary, you have to come up with three things for the listener. And the first one is a desert island drug, and this is not to save you or your family on a desert island, but it's usually where we ask a person to come up with a drug that has a powerful memory for them. Now, this might be slightly different for you, but would you be able to give us a desert island drug from your world? Yeah, this was this was quite a difficult one for me because obviously I'm not in your your world, which I'm sure is quite easy for a pharmacist to come up with. It's so linked to your job. Sure. I thought long and hard about um, caffeine and alcohol and all the things that got me through law school, but I didn't think that probably was a reasonable effort. So the drug I came up with related to a case I had many, many years ago, and it, it stuck with me a long time for some reasons I'll, I'll mention in a minute. But the drug is, now I'm going to try and pronounce this properly and forgive me if I'm wrong, flupentacol or pensicol? Flupenthixol. That's the one. I understand that my limited medical knowledge, that's an antipsychotic medication. It's quite, is it quite old school? Because this case was a long time ago. Yes, very old school antipsychotic. So as I say, it related to, and the reason it's stuck with me, because it related to a case which in sort of risk management terms showed what a difficult um, thing it is for the NHS, for such a huge organisation to avoid errors. The, um, the fact that at some point lots of coincidences will all align themselves and something will happen that no one really could have predicted so i'll briefly tell you about the case i've changed all the facts because obviously it's um, it's confidential but this is what actually happened practically but i, I changed some of the, the circumstances of it the case involves someone called uh, claire who was a patient who was attending an outreach clinic a busy outreach clinic in london and she was a regular attender for her medication for she was on a, a medication for depression so she would attend every two weeks and it was given to her via an injection she'd attend she'd have the injection they give her an appointment for two weeks time she'd turn up and it's all ha- all gone on for years and years and years with no problem at all so one day she turns up different people are working than normal and an administrator comes into the waiting room says is claire here yep I hear they have, she has a chat with the administrator. She takes her through to the medical practitioner who then um, says, hi, Claire, and I sits her down, gives her the injection. 
Um, she has the injection, she leaves, goes home, and we all think that is that. The next day, another Claire attends at the clinic. No appointment. The day before, there had been an appointment for a Claire. Um, no appointment, turn up, and they say, oh, you haven't got an appointment today. I said, oh, no, I'm sure my appointment's for today. They uh, check the records, and they see that she'd had an injection the day before. And then they have a look into it. She says, well, I didn't attend the day before. They check it. There's no other appointment for a Claire. Then they go back, and they see that... Another Claire had had an appointment two weeks before, but it turned up late. And the person who'd carried out the injection out of the hours of the clinic hadn't put the repeat appointment back in the diary because it had been out of hours and they hadn't known the, the procedure. And therefore, the day before, Claire had got the injection for a different Claire. So the combination of factors that had to happen for that to occur. First of all, you had to have two patients called Claire before you could start. Then both of them had to miss their appointments. So you had someone who missed an appointment two weeks before, then the person had to miss the appointment on that day, and then Claire had to turn up on that day where the other Claire had an appointment. All those sequences all had happened at the same time. Then you had to have a change of staff where the administrator and the medical practitioner had a breakdown in communication as to who had done the ID check because the medical practitioner thought the administrator had. The administrator didn't know they had to, took them through, and the other person didn't do the test. There's probably a bit of lack of training there. There's certainly a breakdown in communication. You've got two people with the same name you've got all and all of those things all happened at the same time for it all otherwise it would it would never have happened and it, it did then there was a pretty severe outcome from what happened due to the fact that she was already on a medication then she had another medication and that caused a bad outcome for the patient so that case I was a, I was quite a junior lawyer when I dealt with that case and it always struck me that my goodness when you've got a, an organization that big those sort of coincidences must happen at some time you there must be an alignment of those which is I, I thought it was incredible at the time how all those things could happen. That description of in a big organisation like the NHS, these coincidences will happen. That's the sort of a way of describing the Swiss cheese model and stuff, isn't it? Is that we put all the barriers up, but when you've got millions and millions of cases, at some point the holes are going to line up and these mistakes are going to happen. So that's a sort of really interesting way of describing it. It also sort of says why sometimes the solutions we put in place aren't really that valuable. In that case, we may have done a root cause analysis or something and, and actually the solution we'd come up with probably wouldn't stop another one because another one would never happen but it would just add another layer of bureaucracy into the treatment of a thousand other patients so i think it's a really good case study that i just find it just intriguing from a legal perspective but also from a risk management perspective and from a medical practitioners but it must, and you're right you could put a procedure in to avoid that will you ever avoid it now i can't remember the the drug that this involved but there was a big issue about this would have been 15, 20 years ago in the NHS, where a drug that had to be injected into the muscle was being injected into the bloodstream quite frequently. And when, it's, when it was injected into the bloodstream, it meant that, I think it was certain death. I mean, they, and there'd been about seven, eight, nine, ten of these cases. So there's a big investigation. They looked into it and they decided, right, the only way to avoid this is to have a machine that only injects into the muscle. You can't work it into the bloodstream. I don't know how this happened, but they, they decided that. So they got this machine, they had it, and then about two years afterwards, they had two cases of people injecting into the bloodstream. And what had happened is someone had tried to inject into the bloodstream, it wouldn't work, the machine wouldn't let it happen. So someone modified the machine to inject into the bloodstream because they were so certain that was the way. Put in whatever procedures you want. That's humans for you. Okay, excellent. Well, you can definitely have flu pen thick sole, and it probably was a depot injection. So great. That's your desert island drug. What about a career anthem then, Steve? Oh, this was very difficult because <laughs> lawyers don't sing a lot, to be fair. And we're not allowed to listen to music in work. But um, and my kids wouldn't have trusted me if I hadn't actually said that. They'd say, whatever, whatever song you say, if it's not this one, you're lying. So I had to say this one. And the <laughs> song is The Gambler by Kenny Rogers. Oh, yeah. Excellent. The only reason for it is that it's the only song I know the words to. So it is the only song I can sing in karaoke. When I was about two years qualified in Hugh, I trained at Hugh James and I was, um, I just joined a new office and I was trying to settle in and fit in. And <laughs> we, were, we were in a pub one day, we'd had a few drinks and someone said to me, oh, we do a cabaret at Christmas. Do you want to do something? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll sing Kenny Rogers. It'd be great. Two months later, I was standing on a stage in Merthyr Rugby Club with a cushion at my top and a white beard on and a, and a cowboy hat singing The Gambler. And I've sung it a few times since. 
on various occasions. So that's my, um, so it helped me settle into a new job at least. Very good. Well, that will easily slip into the Spotify or All Apothecary playlist. That's an absolute belter. Bit of a rugby tune as well, I think. Well, unfortunately, with the English rugby team, which yeah, is a bit, I thought it um, was. Yeah, a bit distressing, yeah. I think. Let's not go there, shall we? But yes, Kenny Rogers, the gambler, you're definitely in with that. And the third thing is a book that you might want to recommend to the listener. So I'm interested in your angle on this and what you might come up with. I'm a big uh, fan of legal dramas generally. I got into the legal profession because I liked LA Law back in the mid to late 80s. I thought I'd be honest. Yeah. I like- 